today is Thursday, May 19th, 2016, and we are interviewing Arthur Lee at the Santa Cruz Public Library in Santa Cruz, California. My name is Jeannie Zarnicki, David Addison is recording, and Julie Richardson will be indexing the finished video. We all work for the Santa Cruz Public Library system. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. So Arthur, when and where were you born? I was born in uh, San Diego, California, uh, November 19th, 1928. Okay, and um, let's start off by having you tell us about your, your family background and you know about what you were doing before you joined the military. My uh, dad was Navy career, my grandfather was Navy career, and uh, I remember, well, living in San Diego was the fleet down there. My dad was a destroyer sailor. And my grandfather took me aboard a destroyer when I was two years old, I guess. And he had, there was a great big log, a uh, railroad log there piling. And he, he gave me a handful of nails and a ball peen hammer. And he says, pound all those nails in that log. And the ship was undergoing repairs. So I started pounding away. My grandfather went down the engine room, came back up. I was all out of nails and they were all in that log and I didn't move out of that spot on that destroyer. So my discipline started then. That's great. And um, what, when did you actually join the military? Or actually, let's start with Pearl Harbor because I believe you were still a child. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, because my family was Navy from just after World War I. That was natural. We lived in San Pedro before the war, 1937. The whole family uh, uh, was moved to Hawaii. My dad was a machinist uh, officer. At the time, he was a war officer. And his job was ship repair. And uh, 1937, Hawaii was pretty primitive. I mean, we, we almost had grass shacks on Waikiki Beach. They were pretty singles story places and 1937 I mean we're talking Bing Crosby and, uh, and Lana not, uh, Dorothy Lemore so we uh, we lived out there and uh, my dad retired in 1939 from the Navy and I thought doggone we're stuck here and all of our relatives are back in San Pedro California which was where the battleship were. Now in 1940, President Roosevelt sent all the battle force to Pearl Harbor. And uh, all the crews went with the ships, which normally, I mean formally, had been anchored in Long Beach Harbor. That's where the home port of the fleet was. So all the crews came out with the fleet, but all the dependents were left back in the States. And um, Hawaii wasn't a state at the time, of course. So all of our family friends, shipboard, shipmates, came with the fleet. But we were a rare group because we were dependents that were in Hawaii. In 1937, that just didn't happen. Um, but in 1939, my dad retired and he got himself a good job at Eva Plantation as a machinist. And, uh, and then he moved to uh, uh, the underground fuel storage at Red Hill, and he was a machinist there working underground, making fabulous money, probably, let's say $500 a month. But in 1941, that was a lot of money. So the Navy called him back, gave him a commission as a lieutenant junior grade and uh, cut his pay down to whatever it was then, probably $100 a month or maybe 150 or something. So he was in the back in the Navy nine months or so before Pearl Harbor. We we're talking early 1941. And he was mad, he didn't want to, he lost income. So my family friends came out for short duty at the ammunition depot Westlock, which is part of Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is like a three-leaf clover. 
and uh, this family, the Rutherford family, were they were shipmates back in San Pedro days. So we, uh, well, my folks got divorced. It happens, and so my brother and I were in a foster home for um, six months. But the Rutherford family took us out of the out of the out of the foster home and became our guardian. So we lived with them on the base at Pearl Harbor, Westlock, Ammunition Depot, which was good. We knew that we had known these the Rutherfords back in San Pedro. So we were happy. I mean, really, really happy. My brother and I were like Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. <laughs> we had boats. We were right at Pearl Harbor. And my stepmother became, she became stepmother the leader. Mrs. Rutherford, she was great. You kids do what you want to do. Anything you want to do. She, she knew we could swim, so she didn't worry about it drowning at Pearl Harbor. So we had the whole bay, our, our portion, to be in every day every day and at night I mean we could swim we wore bathing suits well this was grand for two young boys and, and I was 13 and my brother was uh, 10 and we had a next door neighbor and the, um, the there was a marine detachment guard detachment for the base probably I'll just say 50 Marines and they guarded the ammunition uh, so we became real good friends with the Marines. The Marines were probably not much older than we were, 17, 18 years old. So they showed us how to load their weapons. I mean, here's a 13 year old kid, we're, we're, we're loading a, 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 a 1903 Springfield, which is the rifle that they all used. So we loved it, the Marines loved us, we loved the Marines. Couldn't go to the Marine barracks. We had to stay away from, don't bother them, stay. If they're out of the barracks, you can play with the Marines. And the, our next door neighbor, um, Glenn Black, his father was the, let's say the security officer for the base. He, he was in charge of all the Marines. Old China uh, Marine, actually. Well, we couldn't have had a better paradise for two boys, three boys actually. I mean, Westlock was kind of like a jungle and we were protected because we were dependents of officers. We could go anywhere on the base. We can't do that now, of course. And uh, the, uh, but as I said earlier, it was a little bit primitive in Hawaii. There were no exchanges if we had an exchange on the base, it sold toothpaste, combs, you know, stuff that you had to have. You know, they'd open it up once a month and you could buy candy bars or whatever. But if you wanted to do anything, you had to go downtown Honolulu, which we did. And on December 6th, we went downtown Honolulu to do our Christmas shopping. And my dad gave us each a couple of dollars. You could buy anything for two dollars. I mean, you couldn't carry everything you could buy. So, okay, we did our Christmas shopping and we went to see a movie while the adults were shopping. They said, you kids want to watch a matinee? Yeah, we sure do. And we watched, I think it was Caught in the Draft. It was a comedy and it was all about uh, Abbott and Costello, I believe. It's important because the draft, I don't know whether it had started yet or not, but we were just, it was all about Army. We thought, that's really great. That afternoon we got, we got home, we had all of our Christmas presents, and we put them in our bedroom. They hadn't been wrapped yet, we just laid them on the floor. And uh, we were excited. We. Each one of us bought our little things that we were going to have for our parents and each other. So we went to bed happy. I'd seen a movie, an Abbott and Costello movie. We'd done our Christmas shopping December the 6th. Now, two of our family friends, sailors, we knew their wives, their kids back in the States. But they're out here with nobody at all. Their families are in the States. So we had and always invited them over 
and they they had a couple. We had a little couple little cots. They'd stay overnight for dinner, December the sixth. So there, one of them was on the USS Arizona, and one of them was on the USS Maryland. And I think the wives were more friends than the men, but fraternization was not a problem. And. Uh, so they were supposed to come over to our house that night. They had to take a ship's boat all the way over to Westlock. And the, uh, but the Battle of the Bands was supposed to take place at Pearl Harbor. Each battleship, probably other ships as well, if they were big enough to have a band. So the two sailors that were supposed to come over to our house and stay overnight Saturday night, they decided they'd support their band and go to Block Arena and listen to the band and cheer for their, their own band. Well, they both went back to their ships, didn't come to our house. And because uh, my mom, my stepmom, she was glad to have them. And we, you know, they were really family. They would be your friends forever. And. So they did. They stayed, went back to the Arizona and the, and the USS Maryland. Well, we all went to sleep, and I, I'm looking at the little Christmas presents over there. It hadn't been wrapped yet. Anticipation. Had a Christmas tree. About 7:30 in the well, 7:50 in the morning, I was half awake, half asleep. 13 years old, lying in bed, and I heard boom, boom, real heavy explosions. When you're living on an ammunition depot, you don't want to hear that. So boom, boom, I mean, it was, these were deep explosions. They weren't firecrackers. And for kids, you know, we, you didn't have to be very smart to know that deep explosions are bad. But this is, from what I can learn, these were torpedoes hitting our ships. I think the torpedoes were first. And tor torpedoes, uh, when they hit a battleship, they'll make a lot of noise. And I, from the half asleep uh, condition I was in, I woke up right away. And my dad, who was staying overnight, the officers wore khakis then. He's got it suited up right away, and, and, and Mr. Rutherford, he suited up right away because his job, Mr. Rutherford's job, was running the ammunition depot. He had officers senior to him, but, well, there were only three officers on the base. Marine and uh, Warren Officer Rutherford and a lieutenant commander. So the two, my dad and, and, and Mr. Rutherford, they went off to their jobs. My dad jumped in the car and drove to Pearl, around to Pearl Harbor because that was his battle station. You went to the sound of battle. I mean, that, I don't care whether it's Vietnam or Korea or World War II. Where the shooting is, if you're in the military, that's where you're gonna go. We didn't see our, our dad for three days and three nights. So this was terrible because the, the first explosions woke us up, then it got really bad. I mean, they started rapidly, the bombers started, dive bombers started hitting. And my Mrs. Rutherford, she jumped up and, and she ran out and of course, her husband and my dad, they were gone immediately. So we looked out and almost, we couldn't even get to the windows when black smoke came up from the ships, Pearl Harbor. And, uh, and we knew something was bad. We were happy that the ammunition depot wasn't blowing up because it would have been like Port Chicago, we would have been dead. So we, my, Mrs. Rutherford says, okay, I mean, nobody, we were not at war, so no one knew what was happening except we heard these airplanes flying over the house, firing their guns. Pop, 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 pop. You know, I was 13 years old. I'd never heard that before except in movies, but it didn't sound good. And, but these explosions were terrible. I mean, really, really terrible. And it, it was almost like bedlam. 
and bang, 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 loud, loud, loud. And kids don't like to hear loud explosions. So Mrs. Rutherford said, "This is this is terrible. You kids lie on the floor." So we got down because she, she didn't want she. Her husband was a war officer in the Navy. She was aware of, of things. She didn't want the windows blowing out and hitting us, the glass. So she got us on the floor. Well, we had the Honolulu Advertiser comic section. I thought, this is really scary because every time the, our guns started firing almost immediately and the uh, anti-aircraft shells would explode over our house. And the uh, uh, result was that um, uh, we got all the noise. And of course, these airplanes flying over our house. They were, we didn't have, I think we finally got several P 40s in the air. We did, maybe four or five of them, I guess. They, they weren't ours. And I remember at the time that the machine gun fire suddenly became, I was used to it. And you say, why would you get used to it so fast? I got used to it because it was happening so often. And uh, the, uh, what it was with the, the Zeros were strafing roads and military installations, bases, ours, and among others. The, um, the noise was just horrendous. I mean, I, when I was trying to read the comics to take my mind off this, this horrible thing, every time a projectile would explode over our house, which was every, five seconds, my stomach muscles would contract and I'd bounce up off the floor. And I was thinking, this is ridiculous. This is terrible. And uh, so my Mrs. Rutherford said, hey kids, come here and look. So we ran over the window and uh, we're violating what she just told us. And a Japanese airplane was going down in flames. And um, the, all the smoke from the ships was headed, I guess, south. And uh, this Japanese airplane was going down into the smoke. And I said, well, if he continues, he's going to crash into those ships. Probably I was looking at the first kamikaze, or one of them anyway. And because he was certainly on a, he was going right down. And the, the airplane was, let's say, a quarter of an inch. But the fireball was about five times the size of the airplane. And it was going right down into the smoke. And I thought, gee, if I was a poet, that would be poetic. <laughs> and it was headed down into, you know, Battleship Road that was burning. And so they, <clears throat> the Army had a, an anti-aircraft battery. The 251st Coast Artillery had this to protect the base. And it was all their dugouts and their gun emplacements. No guns, because they were out at uh, Nana Cooley. And my cousin was a sergeant in that unit. Well, all of their impl gun emplacements and dugouts were already dug and in place. Well, uh, Mr. Rutherford dashed home and said, you guys were going to put you in the dugout. Families. Uh, three families, three wives, four kids, I guess. So we said, oh, that's good. That sounds pretty good to us. Well, the when we went out of the house, and now we had been, don't, don't forget, we'd been in our house for half an hour undergoing all this, when they say, calamity. And the, uh, so we went out, the sun was shining, shining through all the smoke burning smoke from the ships and it turned everything red and uh, the grass was red the trees were red we were red our skin was red and I thought this is I'm gonna have to remember this I hope I don't forget this no, I didn't forget it everything was blood red and I thought if I was a poet that would I would fit that in there somehow pure red the leaves the grass you know so we ran over and they put us in this dugout. And the raid, of course, the raid was underway. And I don't have a time 
frame on that. I don't know whether it was between raids, because there were two waves of attack. But we were in there, and I remember sitting there and I was saying, well, now there was my brother, me, and the black children. Well, one of them was the girl, beautiful girl. I said, well, if that's the end of the world, at least I'm going with a nice looking gal. And her brother, and her parents, and uh, Mrs. Rutherford, and the CEO of the base, his wife. That was all, it was in his dugout. And they put a hatch over the top. So we were as dark and there were some cracks of light coming down there. And I remember that it had been freshly dug and all the roots of the trees were sticking down inside our, there were a couple little benches in there. So we sat there and, and I was thinking, well, I don't know who's doing this bombing attack. It's either the Japs or the Germans. And I didn't know you, Germany couldn't do it, but they, they had been at war for years and Japan had been at war with China since 33 or something. So, but I said, when our 13 year old kid, but I'd been around the Navy all my life, and I thought, boy, when our fleet sallies forth, whoever's out there, it's coming off of carriers, we knew that, or we assumed that. As soon as our fleet gets out there, they're gonna be sorry. 13 year old kid, thinking like that. And about uh, toward the end of the first attack, the hatch slid open on the, it was just boards, big beams, I guess. And it was Mr. Rutherford, Warren Officer Rutherford. He came down in and he whispered to the ladies, to the mothers, not to the kids. He didn't want us to know. He said, all of our ships are... He said, all of our ships are sunk. I thought, what? All of our ships are sunk. We had destroyers, submarines, uh, all kinds of auxiliary vessels. He meant all the battleships were sunk, because he was a battleship sailor. And I thought, I don't want to hear that. All of our ships are sunk. And there's none of their, our ships going to sail out to attack whatever whoever's out there. He said, all of our ships are sunk. To a 13-year-old who'd been around the Navy all his life, I thought, that's the end of the world. So he closed up the hatches. And I thought, oh boy, this is, this is the end of the world. Because that was our defense, Na national. It wasn't just a couple of ships, it was all of our ships. Of course, there were only eight battleships, but they were all in effect, sunk. So we were commiserating over that, and the hatch slid open again, and it was an army sergeant. And he said, oh, you're gonna have to get out of here, out of this dugout, because this is where we keep our ammunition. <laughs> what? <laughs> so we said, we'll stay, that's okay, and of course, the women said, we're not going to stay in here with the, if you're going to put the ammunition in here for the army guns. So out we went back to the house, which was, there's only three quarters on the base. And uh, the uh, army moved in uh, with their guns, anti-aircraft guns. And uh, during the attack, the uh, uh, USS Pyro was tied up at the ammunition dock because there was an ammunition depot. And one of our family friends was the gunner, gunnery officer on the ship. And there was no, there were no gunners on the ship, very few. Most of them were in Honolulu enjoying Hawaii. And uh, so he organized during the attack, the, the crew that was there, we had some machine gun, they had some machine guns on there and a couple of guns on the stern, like three inch guns, maybe five inch guns, any aircraft gun. And they started firing right away. In fact, when the attack 
started, we went on our front porch at the first firings, and the ship that was tied up, well, no, probably about three or four blocks, city blocks from us, started firing at a Japanese airplane coming across the water. And we watched it, and the pilot was, was uh, making erratic movements with his airplane, and we lived probably 30, 40 feet above the water, the house was up here. And we're looking down at the airplane as he came across. And the ship was firing and it, the projectiles were hitting the water under the, under the airplane and it was all splashing up in the air. And I was thinking, 13 years old, I'm thinking, if that airplane runs into those geysers of water coming up, it's, he's gonna, I'm just going to knock him out of the sky. I don't think the ship was trying to do that. They were trying to shoot the airplane down. And this, it was a Val. It was a dive bomber. And it came right up, but it had to rise up over our house because we were higher than the water. And as he flew up, I was standing here and I was looking, I was trying to see, I wanted to see the pilot and the crewman. I mean, I, I don't know why, it was like, is there a UFO guy in there or what? And I looked and I really, really, my eyes were straining to see, I wanted to see what, who was doing that. But the sun was glinting off the canopy as it flew by. And it blinded, no, it didn't blind me, but I mean, it, I couldn't see inside. And uh, he flew right over the house. And I remember it had the landing gear with the, what we call wheel pants on there. And the site, the bomb site was out on the cowling. And, you know, I'm looking at that, and it had a couple of speed brakes under the wings and the great big rising sun on the side of it. And that's when my dad said, oh, I know who's doing that. That's what it went around there. So we, when the pyro ships, guns was firing, were firing, the uh, Japanese dive bomber came and, and made a run on the ship which was unloading ammunition on the dock at the time. Flat cars with 16-inch projectiles and powder cans and everything. Well, the ship, the few gunners that he was able to round up, they were all firing at this Jap airplane. And uh, I interviewed and wrote an article about this. And the, um, so the uh, two machine gunners they had were up on the bridge and they had what they call ready ammunition boxes with small amount of ammunition, maybe 100 rounds or something, 200 rounds. So the warrant officer that was the gunnery on the ship was officer was trying to get more ammunition up there and more sailors to man the guns. So he picked anybody, mess cooks, whatever, here, do this, and they were loading ammunition. But he had a qualified machine gunner up on the bridge and he was shooting at this one particular, well, he was shooting. They said they flew by as the dive torpedo planes flew by, they were shooting at the torpedo planes. But this one dive bomber came and the gunner uh, <coughs> said that he'd been firing for, for an hour and his loader said, I want to shoot, let me shoot. So the gunner who was qualified, he was a machine gunner, he said, oh, okay, you can shoot. So the unqualified loader was now the shooter. So this dive bomber was coming down and the, the loader was shooting and he wasn't that skilled. He was scared too. And he caused the dive bomber to make, to, to make an erratic turn when he released his bombs. One of them went outboard of the ship, one of them went down through the dock and exploded under the dock. Well, that was good. And he'd shot the ship's antenna off because he was so wild with the shooting. And some of the damage to the ship was due to his shooting. But he did make that airplane change its trajectory. And uh, the bomb that went under the dock and blew up, <coughs> if it had blown up on contact, I wouldn't be here talking to you. It had been another Port Chicago. And the other one went in the water and blew up. Damaged the ship. And the gunnery officer when he was trying to get the five inch or three inch guns firing on the stern of the ship which he did he was the only casualty on the ship because he had unskilled gunners 
and he was trying to help him load and he got his finger caught in there and chopped off in the breach of the gun. And so all the, naturally all of his fellow officers laughed and he's a gunnery officer and he was the only casualty on the ship. Got his finger cut off. I thought that was interesting. But during the attack, the um, Westlock was the recipient of a lot of the wounded, well, non-wounded. The, they were fishing men out of the water, no clothes, and they brought them over to Westlock. And uh, some of the boats that went in, the oil, burning oil at Pearl Harbor, were picking men out of the water, they were jumping off the ship, and, and they would pull them out. And the boats got in so close that the, uh, there were wooden boats in those days. They hadn't invented plastic yet, fiberglass. Boats were smoldering because they'd get right into the fire to pick people out of the water. And they'd come over to Westlock and with sailors, no, no wounded. They'd, they would segregate the wounded, of course, or dead. And they brought them to Westlock. But the, we wouldn't let them land because the, their boats were smoldering and we got all this powder containers burst open. And we won't, hey, get away with that boat, it's burning, smoking. So they, they must have brought a couple hundred sailors over. And there was a lawn at what the ammunition depot. And the next day, or maybe even that day, my brother and I went down, because we were kids, we could go anywhere we wanted. We went down there and it must have been a couple hundred sailors, no clothes or underclothes. The rest of them had been blown off of them or burned off of them. Well, they weren't wounded, they took those out. And they were there for a week, well, several days anyway. And we got, I mean we, the Navy put, gave them blankets. But they slept on that lawn for several days and they were not injured. And we had food, well, there was no problem about that. Marines opened up their chow line for the, we fed them, and their water and everything. And uh, the, the pyro got out of there and went back to the States, I think, the next day. And they wanted to get out fast. The ammunition ship, we only had a couple. We didn't want to lose that. So after the attack, uh, <clears throat> we were back at the house, we were scared. And the uh, uh, whole bay, our, our part, was, had about a, an inch thick layer of fuel, black, black oil. And our dog ran down there and got in it. And what a mess that was. But all of the, the dog went down because all the fish were dead. They were all belly up. The, you could see white bellies of fish, hundreds of them in there. So my brother and I were down there, and there was all kinds of flotsam and junk that was blown off the ships and it was all floating and you could see it and the, the oil kept the waves down and uh, so my brother and I went down and there was all kinds of pieces of airplanes and we couldn't identify half of it so we were poking around down there when I say down there because it was only about 30 40 feet to the water and the Army fired their guns, testing their anti-aircraft guns after the attack. So my brother and I were both barefoot, kids with, we didn't have own shoes. So there were thorns all over this little place where we had to go down. We could carefully pick our way down to the water's edge, we did. When those guns fired, we ran through those thorns up back to the house as fast as we could up the little hill. I don't think we, I don't think our feet touched the ground. We ran right through the thorn patch. We didn't slow down for a second. The, um, we were moved to the quarters, the CO's quarters on the base. There were only three houses on the base. We were moved to the CO's quarters and uh, his wife made food for us because we were hungry. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon. Some of the officers off the sunken ships came over because he was the CO of the base, he was the lieutenant commander. And the captains of the ships 
here we are, little kids, and all these officers in white uniforms. There was because it was Sunday morning, and I remember this one Navy captain, and his white uniform was just speckled with oil that had spots of oil that had gone all over it. And he was hungry, and she said, the CEO's wife said, Are you, you guys must be hungry. And she had a big ham and bread, and she was slicing off ham. And the several of the officers, they said, yeah, we were. And this Navy captain, his hands were as big as baseball ball gloves. And she handed him a ham sandwich, and he would, I think, two bites, he ate that whole sandwich. Great big ham sandwich. And he was shaking, and I thought, this is really bad, really, really bad. And we ate. There was a Marine, I'll never forget this. He must have been 17 years old. He was guarding our quarters because we, we thought we were going to be invaded. And he was sitting there and he had his rifle on his, across his thighs. And he was sitting there just looking around. And he, I think he had one clip of bullets, five bullets. I thought, that's not enough. Because we heard on the radio that the invasion fleet was approaching our base, Westlock. I heard, I thought, damn, that's not what you want to really want to hear. The Japanese fleet is invading this base as we listen to the regular commercial broadcast. And uh, I thought, that Marine, he's going to have to defend us. Five bullets, all the families, the women and children. Men were off, they were doing their, what they had to do. So I looked at that, so, that Marine and I thought, he's, it could be me sitting there. And uh, so the CEO's wife said, do you want, to the Marine, do you want something to eat? And he said, yes ma'am. I thought, wait a minute, Marines are gonna feed him. I mean, I thought, this is odd that we would be feeding him. Nothing wrong with it, I just thought, won't they come with a big, how do they, they must eat, I know they eat in their geek barracks. She, so she made him a ham sandwich and a glass of milk. And he set the glass of milk down there and the ham sandwich down there, started eating it very slowly, casually. I thought, one Merton is gonna defend us. I thought, and he didn't, nothing he did. He just sat there with that rifle and five bullets. And I'll never forget that, it was quiet. And I stood there as a little 13 year old looking up the screen door and I just stood there for five minutes and he sat there he didn't even move can you imagine it though the whole enemy fleet was coming in and he was not even he just thought well oh, I'm here well the enemy fleet turned out to be uh, a, a bunch of fishermen's junks not junks but fishing boats that were came in and they were, they were Japanese but they were local people and that was what was reported and he didn't know that, we didn't know that either. But, <clears throat> so that night, we thought, oh boy, they're gonna, we expected the island to be invaded, everybody did. And senior officers didn't even know it was a war. I mean, recorded testimony, so we didn't even know we were at war yet when we were getting bombed. So, we were scared because we thought we were going to be invaded for sure. Well, that night we put blackout curtains all over because we couldn't put lights on. And Gunnar Rutherford, he said, well, I'll, we'll get our personal weapons. He had a, a rifle, 22 rifle, and a 22 pistol, and, you know, sports stuff that he had. So he was showing Mrs. Rutherford how to load these weapons. And I was standing there, but he wouldn't look at me because I figured that if he had eye contact with me, it meant that I was involved too. By not looking at me, the sense was that you're not gonna be shooting these weapons. But I'm watching because I may, I may have to, 13 years old. And we had BB guns and things. And because we lived in the cane fields, and during the day there had been reports of paratroopers landing there, which they weren't. They were our own people that were shot down. And so we were 
scared. The Army, when they moved in with those anti-aircraft guns, they put a, uh, it was amazing, they built a blockhouse out of sandbags right outside of our bedroom window to defend that portion of the base. Sugarcane fields were all out here. And there had been airplanes crashed in the field, or even if they flew low, we didn't know whether they crashed or not. So the Army set this little, it wasn't a little sandbag bunker out there. And uh, so with Mrs. Rutherford showing, he was Mr. Rutherford showing her how to shoot the gun in case we're overrun, she was going to shoot. Uh, okay. But I'm watching because I want to know how to do this. Well, bullets all over the kitchen table and bullet and guns. And this is all new to me. A BB gun I was very familiar with. I could shoot the bottle cap off the fence anywhere. Well, when the sun, when the sun went down, it got really scary. And they, the Army, these were the 251st Coast Artillery with my cousin's outfit. He was a sergeant. Um, they were a National Guard outfit from San Diego. They'd been there for about a year. And so, as soon as the sun went down, they got us, they were just young kids too. They, they were scared. And so, my brother and I were going to go to sleep. We nothing else to do, no lights, and so our bedroom was right next to that bunker. So we're just laying in our bed there thinking about the day and I'm looking at those Christmas presents thinking, I'm never gonna wrap those. I mean, I, I thought, it's not gonna happen. So we're happy laying in bed and then the army, they would, anytime a leaf would move in the, in the there were some trees out there, they'd shoot at it, bang. Oh geez, here they come now. So they go bang and we jump up in our beds and and they were firing their 1903 rifles and one of them had a BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. And uh, so every, they'd start shooting and they were nervous and we were very nervous. So we ran into the living room and Mrs. Rutherford was there and I said, can we sleep in the living room? were too close to the shooting because the BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle, had fired 20 rounds and we, before we got out of our bedroom, we'd hear, Burr! oh wow, that's too much noise for us. And they were, they, would, they were shooting all the time. Anytime a shadow moved, they would fire because the reports of the cane fields, the paratroopers we were convinced. So we were, uh, stayed in the living room and about eight o'clock, nine o'clock, maybe I don't have a time on this. We were these airplanes flying, and every gun in Pearl Harbor fired, started firing. The sky was just lit with tracers. Um, and we shot down four airplanes, three out of the four. We said, yay, we got them, we got them, they're back, and we, we killed them all, they're shot down. Only thing they did was they were our airplanes. Mm -hmm. We shot down our own airplanes coming in off the Enterprise. Of course, we didn't know that at the time. But for us, we were cheering because every gun was firing. It's like the biggest Fourth of July you'd ever want to see in your life. The uh, so we were we we rejoiced. Now. It was about nine o'clock at night, and so Mrs. Rutherford says, I bet everybody's hungry, because all we had to eat that day was part of a ham sandwich. So she made, we had blue lights for blackout purposes. So she made split pea soup. And so the split pea soup, under those blue lights from battleships, there are battle lights, made it look like gray mud. <laughs> And I remember, the, I'm, I'm saying, this tastes pretty good. Gray mud. The green and the blue, man, it was just like, and it was thick like mud. We ate it. And uh, for the next couple of days, you know, we were scared. I mean, we thought, well, where are they? Well, how come they haven't landed yet? And uh, 
We didn't see our dad for three days and three nights, I guess. I mean, he could have been killed just as, much, just as easily as anybody else. So we said, Dad, what'd you do when you got over there? He said, well, he was a warrant officer at the time. They took all the officers and they put us up in the, the buildings at Pearl Harbor were untouched. These were all the administrative buildings and the shops and so forth. And he said that uh, they gave us 45 caliber pistols and we went up on the top, I mean up on the roof. And when the Jap airplanes flew by, we shot at them with 45 caliber pistols. And uh, I thought, damn, that's good. Did you hit any? Well, I didn't ask that. And some of the material that I've read uh, from Fuchida's books, he said that some of the airplanes that got back to the ships, his airplanes, were had so many bullet holes in them, they just had to push them over the side. Because everybody was shooting at every airplane. I mean, Marines, there was one Marine that was out between our quarters, the two quarters, there's three. He was out there shooting at the airplanes as they flew by, standing there out in the street shooting. Everybody did it. And Fuchita said, yeah, there were about five that were so badly shot up, different caliber bullet holes. He said, we just pushed them over the side. And my, my cousin, who was a sergeant, he said, yeah, he said, everybody had a rifle. We were shooting at every airplane that flew over. The, I've been, I'm a, I would say an honorary member of the uh, Ava Marine Corps Air Station Historical Society. And they've just declared it a national heritage uh, area or something, Ava. And the, it was a Marine Corps Air Station. And they had a squadron of SBD, Scott Bomber Douglas. And, and so Mr. Rutherford went over to take more ammunition over to them because all of the men and Marines were all quite busy and so was he. And he said it was, he said I almost cried when I got there because all the airplanes were lined up and they were all burning, every single one of them. And the Marines put up a good fight over there and I read one account where they had machine guns in one of the airplanes and some Marine got in there and he was shooting at the strafing aircraft from an airplane sitting on the ramp. And I've seen, I think I've seen that recorded a couple of times. The, um, it was scary. It was scary. And the following day, you know, we were just as nervous because we thought they'd be back. Unfortunately, they didn't come back. But, uh, and the ships burned, I don't remember how long they burned. It might have just been one day or the next day, but it seemed like they were smoking for a long time. And the total destruction of our battle fleet, was, that was impressive too. FDR was impressed. Mm -hmm. Negatively, of course. And uh, I belong to the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association, honorary, because I was not active military. And we've met here in Santa Cruz since, since 76. And we started out with 50 actual Pearl Harbor survivors in this area in Monterey. And now there's only two of us left that I know of. And that's a girl named, her last name is Jessie. She was five years old, living at Pearl Harbor, on the base, as I was. My brother's still alive, he's down in uh, Paris, California. And he remembers a lot of things. And uh, I thought I re remembered everything accurately. And I told him the story about when the uh, Army sergeant opened the dugout said we're going to put ammunition in there. And I didn't care, that's fine, it's good, I mean, we're, we're, and I thought that the sergeant ordered us out of the bunker. And that's the way I heard it, you know, women and children get out, we're putting ammo in here. And I was 
remember 13 years old, I'm thinking, wait a minute, whatever happened to the women and children first, uh, that, doesn't that count for something? And uh, evidently didn't. So my brother said, Art, that's not the way it happened. I was, yeah, it was, I remember it. He said, no, no. What happened was, when the sergeant said, we're putting the ammo down here, the women said, we're out of here. I thought, I think he's right. I think he's right. The, uh, we didn't go to school for about three or four months because the schools were all closed. And we had to wait until they dug ditches, trenches for the students. We all got gas masks. And everybody on the island had a gas mask. But we, Navy kids, we had Navy gas masks, which had two canisters on the side, which was good for about two hours, I think, gas attack. And the civilians were given civilian gas masks, which was a face, but it had one canister under the chin, which was only good for an hour. Will last twice as long as the population. We went to school and we had trenches and, and we had, you know, attack, just like your earthquake uh, uh, exercises you have. Do you have any questions about that? I had a question about the artifacts that you brought. I was wondering oh, if you could yeah. talk a, a little bit about Can the artifacts from the Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I'll go ahead and. Uh, uh, this uh, up here, uh, these are pieces of the Japanese airplane. I want to give my grandkids some credit for this. They put this together for a high school project. These are pieces, individual pieces of a, what is a, um, a Kate torpedo bomber, and that's verified. And my dad picked these up and uh, had them in a shoebox for years and then a couple years ago the kids put these up. And these are all pieces of that Japanese airplane. And uh, this down here, this is shrapnel that I personally picked up from our front lawn. And that's pretty, pretty bad. It's all U.S. This is all pieces of U.S. The ammunition that was expended fired at the airplanes. This is a piece of our roof that was shot off and I love to say that it was shot off by Japanese bullets but no way to verify that. Probably more likely a piece of our own shrapnel blew it off the roof but I'm gonna, I'm gonna lie and say it was off, shot off there. The, uh, my dad said he got to the, this is kind of a bad, you might not want to put that on there, but he got to the, the air, I mean the site of this crash. It was a hospital, it was on what they called Hospital Point at Pearl Harbor. And the uh, plane crashed on the edge of the hospital, documented, crashed into the tennis court. And the pilot was ejected from the wreckage and he went through the tennis screen, which was like regular tennis court, and it was like a sieve, and the pilot went through that, broke into pieces that were about the chunks of the mesh of the tennis court screen. And he said it was under the, maybe the nurse's quarters. Most houses in Honolulu were on like stilts, just for maybe cooling or something. And we're talking 1941, so anything built was built in 1921 or... And he said, my dad said he could see the pieces of the pilot up under that house, just covered with flies. And uh, Butch, any battle, that's the way it is almost immediately. And, uh, but that was about two days later, and I said, well, Dad, how come they didn't do something? He said, we were busy with other stuff. And, uh, but he brought this, gathered all this stuff up. This is interesting here, this is called a rocker box cover. And uh, the, uh, there were a couple of airplanes crashed in the cane fields right outside of our house. And the, uh, uh, one was Japanese, one was American. Just recently, they found that they had the crash site, because I'm part of that historical 
honorary part. Uh, that that are, the site of that airplane is now being developers are going to bulldoze that site, and we think there's still parts of that U.S. airplane and the Japanese airplane. Now, when they <coughs> when it was fresh, they brought parts over to Pearl Harbor where we were trying to identify what kind of airplane it was. They were, and they said, "Oh." The Japs are using American engines, Pratt and Whitney engines, in their aircraft. So everybody said, "Oh, that's that's." We were giving them American engines, so everybody believed that. Except within the last year, uh, I got the explanation because this American airplane and the Jap airplane were the crash site is together. They're co-bingled. This is documented. And they said, well, if they're co-mingled and we had soldiers picking up the parts, and if they picked up a piece of American part, brought it over to Pearl Harbor and said, yeah, that's a Pratt & Whitney engine, makes sense. Now, back then it didn't, because we didn't know that these, and I suspect, and I haven't talked to John Bond, he's the historian out there, and I suspect they may have had a mid-air. It crashed in the same site, the cane fields. So uh, the, uh, they're still discovering stuff all the time. And I, some of my recent research, I didn't know we had uh, Jap prison camps out there, POWs. And uh, it was all secret. You don't find this stuff out until after the war. And uh, it was quite, uh, revealing now and things that are secret you know they put a big seal on it stamp it secret and throw it in the archives and no one gets it researchers dig it up years later and they're trying to well they did declare that Eva Marine base as a historical site of the Battle of Pearl Harbor and the sugarcane uh, plantation Eva plantation uh, is, is part of it because they were strafed and and uh, mostly they weren't bombed, but they were strafed. Because the Zeros flew all around the island and fired at anything that moved and any military installation. Now, I've read accounts where uh, Japan, Admiral Nagumo, was told, sink the Navy, when your job's done, that's it. So he said, okay, so he did. And he said, oh, we're out of here. And he took his fleet back to Japan. Everybody's mad at him now. They said, hey, you could have gone in and destroyed the naval base. And he said, yeah, but I, my orders were to get, get out and dodge. So we left. And he was criticized forever for that. And, uh, but then his justification was, I didn't know where the two American carriers were. They were coming back, one from Midway and one from Wake Island. So, but he was afraid that, he said, uh, my job was done. He said, uh, and it actually, he did a pretty good job, really, sinking the battle fleet. But um, it was an interesting time. They, uh, we stayed there at Pearl Harbor for a few months and then they made all the civilians move off the bases. Actually, they <coughs> loaded all the military dependents and sent them back to the States. So Mrs. Rutherford, who became my stepmother eventually, she didn't want to go because they were sending the men back. I mean, they're sending the dependents back, but the men had to stay. She said, well, no, I'm not going to do that. So she got herself a job with the with the Hawaiian Telephone Company, communications. Because only people with um, the defense, uh, let's say defense industry, if you're involved with that, you could remain on the island. So she got that job with the telephone company as a communicator. And that was good, so we got to stay. And <clears throat> but we did have to move into downtown Honolulu. They wouldn't let us stay on the base. So the uh, 
Um, that was perfect. We lived down by Diamond Head by Waikiki Beach. My, and my brother and I, here we now we got Waikiki Beach, and she still didn't care. I mean, she said, fine, you got a bathing suit, go. And as long as we were home before the street lights came on, we are fine. We'd go in the morning before the sun came up. I'm still going to dermatology on that. <laughs> but we, I always had this horrible feeling that I was going to be in Hawaii forever. And we left when I was in the States when I was in the third grade and, and relatives, we had relatives and all my friends, friends, how many friends do you have in the third grade? But uh, I thought, I'll never get back. And it was really a feeling of isolation being in Hawaii. Well, my dad got orders to the States. And uh, that was the greatest thing that ever happened. And the, uh, so we got on a Navy transport, the uh, USS Henderson, old ship, World War I ship. So, oh, was that the happiest day I ever had in my life. So, Clint and I and my dad, and, and by that time, Mrs. Rutherford became my stepmother. She married my dad. So we're on the ship and I was just so happy. Navy, I was getting closer to being in the Navy. I always wanted to be in the Navy. So we had a destroyer with us. Oh, this is really great. We're going back to the States, Navy ship, a couple of guns on the stern. And the uh, we got out, goodbye Hawaii, aloha, I never want to see you again. <laughs> and so the ship's shoved off and we're going. We got this destroyer, so we went to Bed that night, woke up in the morning, no destroyer. So, whoa, whoa where, where's the rest of the ships? It was just us. Well, we had two guns on the stern. It was a Navy transport. So I thought, well, that destroyer was supposed to protect us from submarines. And uh, no, it just got us out of the off the out of the immediate area, and then they went back to Pearl Harbor. Well, so I'm up on deck, and my dad was there, and I said, come on. Whatever happened to our protection? He said, well, we got two guns on the stern. And he, and he said, that's probably good enough. He didn't know either. I mean, his job is repairing ships. He wasn't a planner. So we're going, and, and uh, so the ship slowed down. I mean, we might make two knots in the water, just barely moving. I went, what? So I'm checking with, and there were sailors on the ship, and I said, hey, what, what, how come we're not going faster? Well, we're waiting for a slower ship to catch up. But I know all about submarines, and this is not good, going slow. And so these, these guys were gunners on the, on, the, on the transport. And I said, slower is not better. He said, well, this ship that's catching up with us, the Tyler, I'll remember that name, is could only do 10 knots and we can we can do 15 knots but we got to slow down to 10. So that's terrible and I remember seeing the Tyler coming up pretty heavy seas sun was coming up in the morning and, and I thought damn it we should have had a s but they didn't have any guns so we were the protection for them what happened to our protect we are we were our own protection we did have a submarine we thought because in the middle of the night, our ship's gunners started firing. I thought, damn it, again, I can't get away from this stuff. And in the morning, the gunners said, well, you know, somebody spotted what they thought was a submarine, they were shooting at it. Whether it was or not, I, maybe no one will ever know. I think there were, I haven't tracked it, I think there were some submarines in the area between Pearl Harbor and San Francisco. So. Uh, we got back successfully, and I remember going down the ladder on the transport, and I had a big heavy suitcase, and I said, boy, when I get on that dock in San Francisco, as a, what, 14-year-old by then, I said, I want to jump on that land, and I jumped and I had that heavy suitcase, and almost jerked my arm off by that arm hit. But I was happy to be in the States, and, uh, I couldn't wait to get in the Navy because I was getting closer to, of course it was wartime, 
And during wartime, everything, everybody's in the Army, Navy, Marines, whatever. And I thought, that's what I always want. Since I was two years old, I wanted to be a sailor. And the sailor that was on the Arizona, would per he perished with it. But the other sailor didn't. The, his ship, the uh, Maryland, was torpedoed. And, but it was inboard of one of the others and it sank slowly. I mean, it's mud. Pearl Harbor is only 32 feet deep, I think. And he was okay. The, his ship was mildly damaged. One torpedo, I think. Or maybe it was a bomb. So they were able, able to repair it right away. Of course, my dad's job for the, I think we were out there for about a year and a half after. Yeah, thanks. About a year and a half after. And, oh, this other story. Julie, you'd like this. So we got ready. My dad got orders to Camp Shoemaker, which is out at Pleasanton. And uh, the... Um, so we got ready and they said, Mrs. Lee, um, you and your, you can't go. You can't leave the island. She said, why can't I? My husband's got orders, he's going back this day. Yeah, but you've got a war uh, indispensable job as a communicator for the Hawaiian Telephone Company. We need you, we can't let you go. You're indispensable. That was the excuse she needed to stay there, if you recall. Now it was working against her. So they said, well, Mr. Lee can go back to follow his Navy orders and he can take his two kids with him, but you have to stay. And it took a lot of work to get the paperwork for him. I thought that was funny. You must have questions. So when, when you got back to San Francisco, how old were you at that time? I must have been 14 or 14. 15, maybe 15. Uh -huh. yeah. We lived in, it was nice. I'd never been to San Francisco before. And we lived on what's now the Greyhound bus station. It was an old hotel up there, the Odeon Hotel. And so we lived up there and everybody was in, you know, all the military were in uniform. You couldn't be in civilian clothes. They'd shoot you, I guess. And uh, so we lived in that Odeon Hotel and Mrs., well, Mrs. Lee now, she says, you kids do what you want. Here's a couple of dollars, go to the movie. And we did, we had the run of San Francisco. We went anywhere, did anything we wanted. <laughs> Cable cars, walk. <laughs> Seventh and, well, Mission was, Mission and what's the main, in San Francisco, the main street. <laughs> Let's say Market Street. Market Street. Yeah. Market Street. Yeah. And we lived there for a month. I said, you know, there's not a, blade of green grass around here. <laughs> Not a blade of green grass. Like so we went to Hayward, they, folks, my dad was based at Shoemaker as a training officer. And uh, so we, I worked probably on one of those questions there. So I went to high school at Hayward and worked in a telephone company as a sweeper sweeping floors and I said I want the um, I want to make sure these floors are really swept well because I want to get a good recommendation so I did and I worked for Pacific Telephone and Telegraph they don't call it that anymore now it's Pat Bell or something <clears throat> and I, I was really I really loved it and the telephone company in those days most of the guys were GIs coming back from the war. And they said, hey kid, if you want to join the Navy, do it. They said, There's, this is hopeless, this job, climbing telephone poles. He says, you'll, you'll always be just climbing telephone poles. I said, oh, I'm glad you feel that way. You just got out of the Navy or the Army or the Marines. And he said, they said, if you want to make a career out of the Navy, go. So when I was 17, I joined the Navy. The um, I was a junior in high school, I just finished it, and uh, so I, my, it was kind of a hard time during the war, and my folks were going to get divorced, and every day they were going to get divorced. They drank a lot. In World War II, everybody drank, everybody smoked, so they're going to get divorced. I thought, doggone it, I don't want to go back to the foster home again. So I said, hey dad, how about me join the Navy? And he said, okay. 
I was going to go to finish high school and go to UC Berkeley and be an engineer and live happily ever after. So I'm joining the Navy to be a sailor. And <clears throat> which is actually really what I wanted to do anyway, even though I was college prep at Hayward High School. And uh, so my dad says, yeah. He had, because he was at Shoemaker, California, as a training officer, I got a job there as a, uh, worked in the Navy Exchange, handing out bundles of clean laundry. And uh, thousands of sailors were there. And piles and piles of sea bags. And my dad said, well, son, when you could pick up one of those sea bags, I'll let you join the Navy every day. Couldn't do it, couldn't do it. And uh, I never did. It was too heavy for me, but finally he just said, okay, you can go. I was happy, well, two of the happiest days of my life. The happiest day was when I got married, and the other one was when I joined the Navy. And I have to be sure that I don't get those mixed <laughs> and my wife will complain. Yeah. Well, this is a good place to stop, and then we'll start, you know, with your uh, joining the service.